Well, this morning, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel by John. Uh, for us, our task this morning is to apply what Jesus teaches as far as the Gospel of Salvation to what we see in Revelation. I just want to draw a line between there. Jesus went out and began going throughout the countryside, through each village of Israel, proclaiming the gospel and inviting people. He actually says it by the time we get to Matthew 8. Uh, he invites them to come to a banquet in heaven where they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, he invites people to be born again and go to heaven. Now, we've been studying Revelation, and we're in the fourth week of applying it. And in Revelation 4 and 5, it's primarily about the people in heaven. So the people in heaven are there constantly surrounding the throne, and Jesus is inviting people to join that group. So the gospel presentations Jesus gave were invitations for God to transform them to become worshipers. In fact, that's what we're going to see as you open your Bibles to John chapter 4. And the Gospel of John chapter 4, we're going to read verses 20 to 24 in a few moments. Now, just the, the connection. The Gospel, heaven. How does that impact us today? Well, if we're born again, we are becoming more and more every day worshipers. It isn't heaven that makes us worshipers. It's salvation. And the clearest evidence of salvation is becoming a worshiper of God, as Jesus described today. Okay, let, let me show you what I mean. Because the Bible tells us God seeks true worshipers. First truth we notice when we got to Revelation 4 and 5, only worshipers are in heaven. There's nobody that says, I don't like this, this is awful, I don't want to be here. They aren't, okay? Only worshipers are in heaven. When I used to, I, used to leave, I was a youth pastor, and one of the things I used to take my youth group on, I'd put them all on a bus, just the boys, it was too rough for the girls, and I'd take 50 of them down, and I taught them how to witness outside the bar district of Clemson, Seneca, and Walhalla. Now, you've heard of Sena or Clemson because there's a university there, but those were three mill towns in South Carolina. And we would drive this busload down, and it took an hour to get there, and I explained to them how to share the gospel, and we would put the 50 of them across between the gate of the mill, where 1,500 men worked, and the bar district, where they conveniently cashed their checks for them with a drink. And, you know, they would pile the money up in front of the guy at the bar, and he would end up you know, buy a round for everybody. And he would end up on Friday night going home with just change. And what we were trying to do is get his paycheck home. So we would volunteer to walk the men home before they went to the bar. And, and on the way, we'd share the gospel. Well, you know what we found? There were a whole bunch of men that would stream just like, like you know, a dam bursting. And they were all just stampeding toward the bar. Do you know what most of them, as we talked to them about heaven, they say, I don't want to be there. I, that would be the most uncomfortable place I could ever think of. I don't want to. I, don't, I have no interest. You know what we told them? God will give you what you really want. The people in heaven have, have no desire. They are, they are repulsed by the sins of this world, and the people that aren't in heaven are consumed by the sins of this world. You see, only worshipers are in heaven, and God changes us before we get there. Worship is what the Father seeks. Remember, God, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. God seeks worshipers. And so the whole plan of the scriptures is God seeking to surround himself with his own creations who worship him from the depths of their beings. And so Jesus came seeking and saving lost sinners. And that work of salvation makes us worshipers of God. Finally, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It's not in mechanics and rote. It's not in ritual and rigmarole. It is in spirit, energized by the Holy Spirit. And it is in truth. God only accepts worship on one channel. And it's his channel. And we can have alternatives. Only, he only receives worship in truth. Which is a reflection back of his word. And so, God is seeking true worshipers. 
Well, how we got to this is uh, the book of Revelation 4 and 5 teaches us some foundational truths that anchor us as we go through life to understand what's really going on. The first one we saw four weeks ago is God's word describes the real heaven. Every other description is either fanciful or false. You understand that? Only God designed the absolute, pure, inspired, flawless record of who is in heaven, what is in heaven, and the doctrine of God's presence. Because what heaven is all about, it's not clouds and gold. It's dwelling with God. See, that's why Jesus came. Thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God, what? With us. And he came to be with us, to take us, to dwell forever with God. Then the next week we saw that God's word declares that heaven and hell are eternal. And no matter what anybody says, no matter how much they twist around and say, God didn't mean that, that's not what it says, he did. In fact, I, I reread uh, this week again, Revelation. And in it, in Revelation chapter 20, it says, and the torment that they suffer in Revelation 20 is forever and forever. It's very clear that God believes that heaven and hell last forever. Thirdly, last week we saw God's word demands only one way of salvation no matter how many people want to make other alternate routes. God's designed only one and he only accepts those who come the way uh, according to the truth and get the life which is only in Jesus Christ. But this morning the fourth foundational truth is God seeks true worshipers. And who are true worshipers? Well, that takes us to our text. John chapter 4, it's Jesus explaining that. In fact, this, this is a very, very special portion of the Word of God when it relates to worship because the heartbeat of God's Word is worship. In fact, we're going to see in just a moment, I'll take you through, that, that you can actually outline the whole Bible as the unfolding of God revealing His desire and his plan to be worshipped. But in John 4, Jesus defines believers as worshipers. That's the primary definition. In fact, Paul picks up on that. And Paul in Romans 12 says that we're supposed to be offering our lives living sacrifices, and he uses the word la tereo, which is a life of worship. And then he says to the Philippians, we're the true circumcision. He said, those people have only had their bodies circumcised. He says, we've had our hearts circumcised. And how do we know that? We worship God in the spirit. And so believers are worshipers, and the word translated worship is 65 times in the New Testament. Ten of those are clustered in these four little verses. You see, this is the mother load. This is Jesus explaining worship, okay? And I thought what we'd do this morning is we'd read it together. So I put it on the screen. So let's all stand, and you don't even have to look down. You can look up, and let's try and read it. It's not very often. When I was little, we all stood and read the Bible. Everyone had the same Bible. You know, everybody in the whole church had the very same. We can't do that anymore, so once in a while we get to do it. And so let's, let's read this together, okay? Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Let's bow together. Thank you, O Lord, for letting us hear your voice by hearing your words actually written down for us that we can hear and with our spirits know that you are speaking. And I pray that we would hear your voice this morning and know you better and follow you more, especially as worshipers. Teach us that, I pray, that as believers, we are primarily worshipers in every dimension of our lives. May we dedicate ourselves to that end even more today 
for Jesus' sake. Amen? You may be seated. Well, I told you that uh, worship, it's the theme of God's Word. We could, we could actually describe the whole Bible with the theme of worship. Now, one of my heroes uh, who's now with the Lord is W.A. Criswell. He was a pastor of First Baptist Church of Dallas for 50 years. But he used to have a tradition after, I don't know, about 20 years at First Baptist, they started a New Year's Eve service where they would have a big church dinner. It was a huge church, thousands of people. Billy Graham used to be a member there before he moved to the church in North Carolina. But, but when, when they'd have this dinner, and then after the dinner at 6, at 7, they would go into the, the big worship center, and W.A. would preach through the entire, every book of the Bible for five hours or a little less than that and then they'd serve communion and it would be midnight and that's how every year he would give them the big picture the overview of the whole Bible well let's do an overview of the Bible in less than six hours okay the driving message of salvation is worship Jesus told us you just read it with me the only thing God seeks is worship so if you think about it the purpose of salvation is to get worshipers of God in heaven. The Lord is coming down to rescue out of the lost creation of his humanity and his image those who will respond to the gospel of Christ to become worshipers. And if you look at Revelation, you see that, that Revelation completes for us that the idea that all of these who, who were lost and found end up, and we're starting to see them in 4 and 5 and all of them finally there in 21 and 22 of Revelation, are there in heaven. So, the scriptures open in Genesis with God walking and talking with his worshipers. Before Adam and Eve fell into sin, they were worshiping God. They, were, they couldn't wait. They just, every day he'd meet them and they had the joy of walking with God. But then sin came. And they fell from having the unfettered, unhindered, unbroken worship with God because their sins separated them from God. And so the Lord comes down and finds them, remember, there's the picture of salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Who was looking for whom? Adam and Eve are hiding. That's what sin makes us do. We want to cover and hide and, and obfuscate and justify and rationalize. And God came looking and said, where art thou? Genesis 3. And he explained to them and demonstrated for them that only through a substitutionary sacrificial offering that they made obediently as an act of worship could they be restored to fellowship with him. And so they had a substitute slain for them, and that substitute was made into a, a picture because the animals that were slain were made into their coverings, and they saw that only covered by a sacrifice in their place could they come back to God. And that's the whole story of how Adam and Eve were clothed to show of their need of being clothed in Christ. Well, the next book of the Bible, Exodus, contains an elaborate set of plans for a tent whose sole purpose was to bring worshipers to God. So God had them, this, this tent was transporting nomadic desert dwellers from the dry and barren wastelands of the Sinai Desert to right in front of the very throne of God. They could go there anytime they wanted to, just as long as they came the way God told them to come. And you know what, from Exodus on, what happens? I mean, some want to come this way, and so God burns them up. And others say, we don't want to go that way, so God opens the ground and swallows them. And other people say, we're going to worship someone else, so God sends serpents or fire. Wow. He's really concerned that they come his way. And he makes that really underlined in their minds. And then we come to the longest book at the heart of God's word. It's a manual on ways to worship the God of the universe. In fact, the book of Psalms are mostly songs of worship pointed at the God of the universe. And we see you can worship God from any dimension of life as David in over 70 of the Psalms shows us from the pits of despair to the heights of, of joy. And by the way, the rest of the Old Testament is just a series of Prophetic lamentations on the neglect and abandonment of worship by God, by his people. Remember, they were called to be a kingdom, a priest, a holy nation, and they were supposed to be worshiping God, and they were worshiping, by the time we get to Habakkuk, they're worshiping their careers. He says, you worship your net, and you know, the thing that catches your fish, instead of me who made the fish. And, and just, he just is lamenting their lack of worship of the true and living God. So the gospel's open with the very same theme, the God of heaven and earth seeking his creatures who would be willing to become worshipers. 
As an infant, he is welcomed by kneeling shepherds and worshipped by wise men. He is followed for three plus years by a band of disciples who every time Jesus displayed any trappings of the infinite majesty of God, they just were overwhelmed and they'd fall down and they would just adoringly, in awestruck wonder, worship him. And after the cross, the gospel spreads out and the book of Acts records what happens when average people, Jews and Gentiles, from every walk of life, from every strata of society, and from every depth of sin, get bound together with a common passion of being lifelong worshipers of God. It was the pointing of their life to God. And, you know, when you talk about, oh, the first century church, yeah. You know what's so amazing? They were very clear on what life was about. It was to be pointed at God and to be what we're going to be now, worshipers. So worship is the theme of God's word. The epistles are merely a training manual on how to grow as worshipers, both personally and corporately. These things diminish your ability to worship. These things quench the Spirit of God. These things grieve the Spirit of God. And you can't offer worship if he's grieved and quenched. And so don't do those things. And corporately, worship is enhanced the more that you corporately know and understand and live and follow and focus on God. So that's all the epistles. And then when we get to Revelation, it just ends what Genesis started. The God of the universe is walking again with and sharing his worshiping creatures forever dwelling with us, just as he promised. Remember, God with us. And we're enjoying him forever. And God's word closes with all of God's worshipers, home at last, surrounding the throne, worshiping him. That's the whole Bible. And what's amazing about that is, it's written to ask us, Are we worshipers? Are you a worshiper? Is is your heart the heart of a worshiper? And and so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to go through Jesus' gospel presentations to make sure that, that we're connected with what salvation's transformation is supposed to do. It it liberates us from our sins, from the grip of sins that that keep us from being a worshiper, and it liberates us to truly worship God as we were created to be. By the way, the word worship is full of meaning. It expresses the idea of falling down, pros kuneo. Pros is to or toward, and kuneo is to bow or kiss or fall. And so it's just an oriental word. It's very picturesque. It's the idea of falling down, prostrating oneself, kissing the feet of of someone you admire, or the hem of their garment. And and every part of it is a physical response to a heart of adoration. And we just are moved. And we can't stay the same. Now, worship is much studied. In fact, I, I have... 25, 27, 30, I don't know how many different volumes on theologies of worship. And, and basically, if you read most of them, you find that they all center around kind of some basic themes. And basically, there are five, and I'll just give them to you. Uh, if I summed up all my books on worship, it would be this. Worship has been defined as when God's holiness quickens my conscience. Now, see, a lot of people, I mean, to them, worship is music. They're kind. And if they don't get it, they didn't worship. That's not worship. Worship really doesn't have anything to do with music. It is when God's holiness quickens my conscience. And I realize he's holy. And immediately I realize how far short my life falls from that. And my conscience is quickened to say, you came to change me. And so any part of my life, it was in the words this morning we were reading, don't, don't let me not cooperate with the war you want to wage within me. Did you see that line in the song we sang this morning? It's God wants us to allow him to mortify every part of our life that his holiness doesn't reign in. So worship is when God's holiness quickens my conscience to where he's not being pleased by my life and I surrender that one to him. And his truth feeds my mind. Once I was born again, my mind has to be fed. And if it's not fed, it's emaciated. Uh, For my first five years of ministry, I was a senior adult pastor with John MacArthur, and I had 864 senior adults. They were all 65 plus when I got them. 
I did a funeral every week. I mean, it was unbelievable. I had so many on respirators, so many on chemo, so many on ventilators, so many that, that were on dialysis. When you have a population that's all of them are over 65, it was phenomenal. And you know what? I had so many people that I saw the ravages of chemo. You know, what chemo is, is it, they try and kill the cancer before they kill you. They're using a poison that's going to kill you eventually, but they're hoping to get the cancer before they get you. And the people just wither away. I mean, so that they, they just are wisp and their hair falls out. And they just get, I mean, their skin is so thin, it just is like tissue paper. And you touch them, and it's just like a Georgia peach. They immediately are bruised. And it's just, and, and once the chemo is over, they try and rebuild them and feed them. And you all, you see that life coming back to them. And, and they start getting color, and they start putting on a little weight. Did you know that the instant of our salvation, there's only one thing that feeds our mind? Now we can put a lot in there. There's only one thing that feeds it. It's the truth of God's word. And did you know many believers, if we could put on little spiritual glasses and see what they look like spiritually, they look like they're on chemo. They're, they're tottery. They can hardly make it. They're weak. Their skin is so... Everything bruises them. You know why? They're not feeding their minds with truth. They're feeding it with a lot of other stuff. I mean, whatever Hollywood comes up with, with the latest occult or Hinduism or reincarnation or immorality, as long as it's loud and pretty and someone they like is in it, it's only got a little bad. But boy, they're just... It's just filling that mind, and that mind is starving and emaciated and weak and getting bruised. And worship is when God's truth is feeding my mind. I can't really worship him no matter how loud the music gets if I don't have holiness and truth. His beauty begins to purge my imagination. Remember Ezekiel? One of those books in the middle when you're going through the Old Testament. You know, it's one of those long ones, 48 chapters. And Ezekiel, in about chapter 8, he's a prophet of God, and, and God says, you know, I'm going to destroy the nation of Israel for this reason you want to see. And he says, yeah. And the Lord says, get down on your hands and knees and dig through this wall, and you're going to see inside the chamber the imagination of the leaders of my people. And Ezekiel says, what? God says, I'm going to show you what goes on in their minds, the chambers of their imaginations. They're wearing all those white robes with the gold on them and the stones, and they're going around with incense and killing animals, but this is what they're thinking about. So he got on his hands and knees and dug through the wall, kind of like an adobe mud wall. And when he got in, he looked inside, and he saw all kinds of filth and all kinds of evil and all kinds of wickedness and creatures that were hideous. And he just retracted right out of that hole. He says, God, why'd you have me stick my head in there? That is horrible. And God says, that's what the people coming before me have on their minds. And he said, that's what I think of it. It's horrible too. And you see, what worship does is worship purges our imagination, because the beauty of God begins to take the place. You know how the hymn writer Helen Lemel put it, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So worship is when God's beauty starts purging my imagination, and I don't have all that stuff that Ezekiel saw digging through the hole of the imagination. And God's love opens my heart. In other words, I don't fear God. I mean, I don't obey God because I fear him. It's not because I'm afraid he's going to swap me one it's because I love him and that his love constrains me Paul said second Corinthians chapter 5 for the love of Christ constrains us and and so his love see worship leads me to allow his love to open my heart to people to his word to his everything and that's that's what a worshiper is and finally God's purposes then capture my will. You see, worship really transforms us. As we worship, God's holiness quickens our conscience, and we realize how, how much we need him to keep us clean. His truth feeds my mind, and I start discerning. His beauty purges my imagination and drives away those things that, that diminish the Spirit's work in me, and his love opens my heart, and his purposes capture my will. Now, does that really describe most believers? Mm -mm, probably not. Nope. That, that life of a worshiper, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I have many people um, send me little notes and call, and I see them all over the place. And it's so sweet. They say, oh, I don't know how to tell you this, but 
all of our friends think we've been too long in Revelation. I thought, you know, we could stay in Ezra forever. It's the word of God. It's the truth of God. It doesn't matter where we are. All of it says the same thing. I don't know if you've noticed that. Every part of the Bible says the same thing. And what it's saying is we're supposed to be living like we're citizens of heaven. And they worship up there. You know, someone put it this way. The immense tragedy of the contemporary church is most people worship their work. They're still like Habakkuk. or They're worshiping their net. And they think they were designed for one thing, and that net, their job, where they can capture more money is what they were designed for, capture more praise or show off or whatever it is that their work does. And they work at their play. Their recreation doesn't allow them to rest and relax and set apart and slow down. They just get worn out in their play. And then they show up and they play at their worship. They just show up and go through the motions, and they're back to the real world. And that's the immense tragedy of our world. But let's contrast that with Christ's invitations to salvation. What was the message Jesus gave to those who hear him? In fact, what we have before us, and and go back to chapter 1 of John. We're going to start in verse 12. We're going to look at the gospel presentations captured in this book. And what we're going to find out is what Jesus said, because all those people that he shared the gospel with that, that embraced him end up up there. And so what did he say to get him ready? And have we allowed him to do the same thing in us? That's what it's all about. And by the way, John captures 24 times of Jesus describing those believers who will surround the throne. In fact, every one of Jesus, in fact, this week, I I spent the whole week tracking down, there are 89 chapters in the New Testament, and it only takes, you know, about six hours to to read all the gospels less than that actually and and just circling every time jesus describes salvation and there there are about 90 of them and there are 24 of them in the gospel of john and let me just show you some of those number one a believer is someone who possesses christ who becomes god's child by a supernatural event that's the first time the salvation message comes out and it's in verse 12 look at john 1 12 yet to all who received him didn't join a church, didn't have someone do something to them when they were eight days old, didn't recite something, they received Christ. You know, yesterday I talked to Alex. Alex is a fellow, I just had more fun talking to him. We just struck it right off. He's from Monterey. He's from Monterey, Mexico. Has six kids. He was all jazzed that I had eight, you know. He thought he had too many and find someone with more he didn't feel as bad about, you know, life. And we started talking and everything. And he had no idea I was so friendly because I was intentional. And I was, after about 20 minutes, I said, and by the way, and started sharing the gospel with him. Well, I mean, he just about fainted. That is the last thing he wanted to talk about. And what he said is, hey, hey, I'm Roman Catholic, and the church is getting me to heaven. Wow. Wow. The church has never gotten anyone to heaven. The church never will get anybody to heaven. The church cannot get anybody to heaven. Any church, including this one, can't get anybody to heaven. Jesus said in verse 12, it's those who receive him. To those who believed in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. A believer is someone who possesses Christ. You know, I love to listen to people's testimony. They say, well, I did this, and I did this, and the preacher did that, and then I prayed this. I'm waiting for what Christ did. What God did. Salvation is of the Lord, Jonah 2, 9. God has to do something. You know, we, when we moved many years ago to Tulsa from New England, one of the people in church wanted to build a house. I didn't want a house. You know, I don't like to maintain stuff. They said, we want to build your house. So they built this house, and it was, it was beautiful. And uh, they wanted to, this contractor brought us in for the great day of the unveiling, and, and, and his wife had turned off the electricity, and I was supposed to turn on the electricity. You know, it goes on to our name, and it gone off the construction thing and everything. But... You know, I had it on a list, but I never thought about doing it. I showed up at the house, and he comes to flip on the switch and show the finished product. And he flipped the switch, and nothing happened. And I thought about that. I thought about what a beautiful house. It was intricately wired. It had all of this stuff. But the power company had not turned the switch on, and there was no power, and nothing worked. Did you know that's like a lot of people that are going to stand before Christ in Matthew 7, And they have the most intricate, beautiful religious life. The switch never was turned on. They never knew him. They were religious. They knew all the stuff. There's no power. 
No transformation. No supernatural event. Look at verse 13. Children born not of natural descent. It's not because of your parents. It's not of human decision, not what I did, or of a husband's will. And this is talking about the birth of a child, but it has spiritual implications. But born of God. See, salvation is supernatural. I can't, I can't save someone. And we can't save ourselves. It's a supernatural event. We possess Christ, and we become God's child by a supernatural event. Second description, look at verse 29, chapter 1. The next day John saw Jesus coming, and look how salvation is explained. Behold, or look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A believer is someone who understands salvation is only by trusting one who took my place. Substitution is the essence of the gospel. I stood condemned. I am a guilty, wretched sinner. Someone perfect and flawless and harmless and holy and undefiled took all of my sins on himself. He is the lamb, the substitute, the only hope. He took my place. You know, that's why it's such an amazing thing. Jesus said, to whom much is forgiven, the same what? Loves much. When you realize what he did, what God did to him, taking my sins and treating Jesus like he committed them all, it makes us love him more and more. Thirdly, of 24, a believer is someone who is overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you, this one a lot of people don't even think about. Look how John the Baptist describes Jesus. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, John the Baptist is saying, I'm a prophet, and the one who sent me, which is the infinite almighty God, said, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Did you know how the last prophet of the Old Testament described the Messiah and the salvation that he came to accomplish on the cross, that those who are someday going to be worshiping around the throne only get there if they've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. What, what is that? God's Holy Spirit comes and invades every part of our being and stands by to transform, deliver, heal, and protect us. It is baptism, bapto, baptizo, means to be overwhelmed. If, if I want to overwhelm a cup, which is how baptism is used often in Greek literature, I, I stick it in the water. The water overwhelms it. It surrounds it. It fills it. It covers it. It affects it. It washes it. It does whatever. But the water overwhelms the cup. We have to be overwhelmed. We're the cup and the spirit is the water. We have to be overwhelmed by the spirit. Now, Take that a step further. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the washing away of our sins. It's the supernatural implantation of a new heart, Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. A new heart I will give you. A new spirit I will give you. I'll take away the stony heart. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, and you shall keep my commandments and do that. All of that is what he's talking about baptized by the Holy Spirit. A supernatural implantation of a new heart, the beginning of God's work in our lives. It's instantaneous, and it's supernatural. And you know what triggers it? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Repent and turn. It has a a multitude, in fact, 89 different descriptions in the Gospels, but all of them involve a supernatural event where the Holy Spirit overwhelms me. And, and cleans me out and puts a brand new operating system in me. It's instantaneous and it's supernatural. So, in a sense, baptism does save us. You know, there's that whole Church of Christ, you know, uh, group that says you've got to be baptized to be saved. In a sense, they're right. Because baptism does save us. Baptism does wash away all sin. But the baptism that does that is only performed once. And it's only performed by God the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said there's one Lord, one faith, and one what? Baptism. And it's so important, God handles it. But once he does, those whom overwhelmed by the Spirit get a new heart, cleansed and regenerated, justified, and covered with the imputed righteousness of Christ. They come out of that process so changed that they say, 
God, what, what, what do you want me to do? I have a new operating system, and I'm just dying to know what you want me to do. And the Lord says, everyone who has that transformation needs to be baptized afterward. Not to cause it. Afterward, so that everybody on the outside can hear them testify that God has saved me. God has given me a new heart. The Holy Spirit has overwhelmed me, regenerated me, and done a supernatural work I could never do. And I've been saved. And I'm going to portray that for you by saying that I identify with the death of Jesus Christ, his burial, and his resurrection. So that's the third description. The fourth one is in chapter 2. Just turn the page. Look at verse 11. This is amazing. The, the water and the wine Cana wedding. You know what it says in, in chapter 2? A believer is someone who is saved only by hanging on to Christ alone. Saved by hanging on to Christ. Look what the 11th verse says. This is the first of his miraculous signs. By the way, John has seven of them. The whole book is built around the seven signs that Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory. Now look at this description of salvation. And his disciples put their faith in him. Salvation is when a believer is hanging on to Christ. Not their church, like Alex yesterday. Church will take care of it. I go once a week, he said. Well, not every week. But I, they'll take care of it, you know. Thanks. Check off that box. So, even though I don't determine his eternal destiny, he told me yesterday he's not going to heaven. Because the only people who get to heaven are the ones that are carried there by Christ. They have to be holding on to him to get there. So we can put it this way. Salvation is a person. He's our substitute. And we cling to him. And hold on to what he did for us. And by the way, we're not saved by how hard we're holding on to him. Remember I've told you a story how I lost all my hair. I had eight children. They all sat on my shoulders. And I used to have this big head of hair. And they would hold on like reins, you know. And they would ride on my shoulder. And they, I didn't realize they were tugging away. And it loosened it all. And it fell out. But what they didn't realize is they were not held on my shoulders by clutching my hair. I was holding it. They couldn't have fallen off. They could have tried a backflip if they wanted. I was holding them. And how much more does God hold us? See, it's not how tightly we hold to him, but what he's saying is we put our faith that he's the one that holds us. Number five, John 3. A believer is someone who gets to start life over again. Did you know so many of our rich and famous that end their lives tragically, uh, you know, with overdoses that they don't intend to do and whatever, you know. Do you know why? Because they're so hopeless, so despairing, so they've tried everything a hundred times and there's a diminishing return and an increased cost and they just, it's hard to keep on. You know what we get? A believer is someone who gets to start life over again. In fact, you start over again in Christ and he lets you be a new creation and you get a new beginning every day. In fact, every moment. In fact, we're constantly uh, having a new beginning. We see Christ as our only hope and we live the truth, we love the light and God's wrath has been removed from us forever. You say, where is that? Well, John 3, verses 3, 5, and 7. A believer gets to start life over again. In reply to Nicodemus, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. What is this born again? It's becoming a baby. A baby has no past, only a future. See, that's the neat thing about the new birth. We don't have a past. It's gone. We just have a future. All the past is taken care of once and for all. Punishment made upon Christ. And Jesus answered, verse 5, I tell the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and by the Spirit. And you say, what's water and by the Spirit? Well, you know, there's a whole group that say that's by physical birth and spiritual birth, and that's fine, that's valid. Also, the scriptures talk about the Word of God, the washing of the Word and, and regeneration through the Spirit. But it doesn't matter because it's supernatural. And we're born of water and the Spirit, and you shouldn't be surprised because I said you have to be born again. We get to start life over again. It's but it is like a birth. You know, I ask people when I'm witnessing, I say, how old are you? And they go, oh, you know, 29. I go, great. You know how old you are, right? Did you know you have to have a second event like your birth? It's called the second birth, the new birth, born again. It doesn't just happen. I said, did you just happen? 
Did you just kind of slowly appear in parts, you know? You're in your nursery, little pieces started showing up? Or was it an event? And, and that's how the Bible describes salvation, as an event. But a believer looks at Christ as their only hope. You notice, this is the famous one, John 3, 15 and 16, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that, and gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Not in the church, not in what they did, not in what they hope they'll do. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever doesn't believe stands condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of God's one and only Son. A believer looks at Christ as their only hope. A believer loves the truth, loves the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light. He won't come to light, his fearing his deeds will be exposed, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. A believer loves the light and lives the truth. And that's how Jesus explained it. That's indicator of who's going to heaven. A believer has God's wrath removed from their life by accepting the Son. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son, rejects, will not accept that free gift, will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. See, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness, like a heat-seeking missile. No matter what you say, no matter what you cover it up, if there's sin, if you and I die in our sins, the wrath of God remains on us forever. So God seeks true worshipers. Only worshipers get to heaven. Jesus came to seek and save lost sinners, make them worshipers. And God is a spirit. He said, if you're truly mine, you must worship him in spirit. The Spirit of God has to transform us, and in truth, His way. Are we worshipers? Do we have the heart of a worshiper? Do we have this idea in our life of falling down and prostrating ourselves before our God? Is that what we want to more and more? Is, is, am I trying more and more of my life to get under the submission to the absolute control of Jesus Christ? Well, worship grows when God's holiness quickens my conscience. You want to grow as a worshiper? Say, God, quicken my conscience. Worship grows when God's truth is feeding my mind. You want to grow as a worshiper? Say, God, I want your truth to feed my mind. When God's beauty is purging my imagination, are you distracted and babbling with, oh, I just wish I couldn't have all those thoughts? Let God's beauty purge your imagination. It's when God's love opens my heart and I realize that it's it's not drudgery to follow him. His love constrains me, and his purposes capture my will. Now it's time to go. What I thought we'd do is let's all stand, and we're going to close this way. On the screen before you are five options. It's almost like imagine you're standing at the fast food counter. You've got to choose something, only this is permanent, not fast food. Those in heaven are those who supernaturally have been quickened by God's holiness, fed by his truth, purged by his beauty, opened to a life loving him, and have been captured by his purposes. Now that's what God wants to do. And he'll do it one way or another in our lives. The best way to do is just say, I, I agree, I want that too. I surrender to what you want. So pick one of those. How are you doing in the imagination department or your mind with the word or your conscience? Are you like Lot? Are you just getting as close to sin as possible? And say, Lord, make my conscience so I distance myself. Do you even live for God's purpose? I mean, do you start every day saying, I want to do your will? So what we're going to do is, first service, we did a minute. A minute seems like eternity. So 30 seconds, okay? Because people were starting to cough. Um, <laughs> I mean, to be absolutely quiet for a minute in here is deafening. So, 30 seconds. Pick one of those. And right where you're standing, cry out to God and say, I want you to do that by your grace in me. Let's bow together and I'll close.
And Father, 30 seconds is sure a long time in the quiet. But Lord, you said if we call on you, you will do great and mighty things in our life that we don't even understand now. And I pray that many of your servants called on you to quicken or purge or open or feed or to captivate. And I pray that we would grow in our life of worship for your glory alone and by your powerful grace alone. And Lord, for anybody that needs someone to encourage and come alongside, maybe even introduce them, to, to, to stand with them while you turn on the power switch of their life. I pray that at the end of the service, as the elders and godly Titus two women are here with open Bibles, that anybody that you're working in their heart would come for the rest of us. May we grow as worshipers. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.